she didn't know the full extent. A music minister with a secret. I was the biggest poser, the biggest hypocrite. And a love child. One of the women is pregnant, and I'm pretty sure that I'm the father. Plus, the hidden face of porn. He filmed me being raped and kicked. The costs. Lost my job, lost my church, lost my family. And consequences. Two billion people can go to hell so I can watch naked women. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this edition of the 700 Club. I know I've been telling you how warm it is here. I know I've been telling you we got the Gulf Stream right by here in Virginia Beach, and I've just told everybody in the Northeast to move. I, I may have to take some of it back, because we had a big snow here in Virginia Beach. And here are some beauty shots in front of our uh, studio and out on the campus of Regent University, and just to see how pretty it is. Really, with the snow, it's been, it's been lovely. Look at that. And this is the place right there where we're broadcasting from at this moment. And there is the campus, and there's the eternal flame in front of our headquarters. And you still ought to come, snow or no snow, but it does get warmer. Uh, but uh, we can't uh, exactly brag about the snow here because Boston, different story. They call it Snowmageddon. Uh, they've had over 100 inches of snow in Boston, and that city isn't alone. And now, all the way from the northeast to Texas, we're getting, a, what do they call it, Siberian Express is running through. Gary Lane has that story. Old man winter just keeps on coming. A mix of sleet, freezing rain, and snow fell from northern Texas through the Gulf Coast and southeast. Up to 10 inches of snow fell in parts of Virginia. The wintry weather caused tens of thousands of power outages, burst water pipes, and accidents. In Maine, a snow squall caused a 70-car pileup on I-95 between Newport and Bangor. Wayne Trafton told a passenger in his vehicle they were going to crash. We were down to probably 25 or 30 miles an hour when I when I hit the uh, minivan and I just told him to brace himself and uh, we uh, collided with the minivan that was packed that had crashed into a pickup truck. Remarkably, no one was killed, but more than a dozen people were rushed to the hospital. The northbound lanes of the highway were closed down for five hours. While Boston is still digging out from a record 100 inches of snow this winter, in nearby New Hampshire, Drew Mullins of Petersboro says he's glad he's still alive. He was raking heavy snow from the roof of his house because he didn't want the roof to collapse. That's when the avalanche came. I was thinking about my wife and my daughter and thinking that um, I'm not going out this way. The rushing snow carried him off the roof and buried him in a snowbank. His wife Deanna came to his rescue. I tried to dig him out as best I could, you know, with my bare hands. But she finally got him out with help from their daughters. <laughs> and a rare experience in the Deep South, enough snow to enjoy sledding down a hill in Alabama. Here at CBN Center in Virginia Beach, probably about four inches of snow. Right now we're getting a little freezing rain. But this is the second most significant snowfall that we've had in the last week. Schools are closed today. Kids are likely to have much more fun this time because this is a packing snow. It's much better for making snowballs and snowmen. Most people are just trying to make the best of it. Motorcycling in the snow may be a challenge for this Alabama man, but at least he can make a biker snowman. Gary Lane, CBN News. Hey, it's fun. I think snow, I th Boston is not fun anymore. It's pretty horrible. Hey, by the way, we've gotten some number of letters. So where's Terry? Terry's had sort of a virus and she's out this week. She'll be back next week. And Wendy uh, is on assignment uh, covering a very interesting story about a great man who died recently. And we'll be telling you about that next week. Well, in other news, supporters of the radical Islamic group ISIS have been arrested here in the United States. And guess what they said they were going to do? They want to kill President Obama, who we understand is their friend. John Jessup has that story from the CBN newsroom. Here's John. Pat, three Brooklyn men have been arrested and accused of trying to join ISIS to help murder Americans. And prosecutors say one suspect had plans to bomb New York. Mark Martin has the story. 
The three suspects appeared in New York and Florida. They're accused of plotting to join the terror group ISIS and kill Americans, including President Obama. They're charged with conspiring to support ISIS. This is real. This is the concern about the lone wolf inspired to act without ever going to the Middle East. Police arrested one of the men at JFK Airport. Police and the FBI say he was about to head to Syria. Defense attorney Adam Perlmutter says everyone involved needs to take a step back. There's just the rush to prosecution, to arrest, and to conviction. And I just remind everybody today that the presumption of innocence is still the law of the land in America. The three men live in Brooklyn, but are from Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. The FBI began their investigation after one of the suspects, 24-year-old Abdurasul Jurabov, allegedly posted on an ISIS website back in August. I am in USA now, but is it possible to commit ourselves as dedicated martyrs anyway while here? To shoot Obama and then get shot ourselves, will it do? Thank God we will never know if they really were intent on committing acts of terror or were just talking. Investigators claim killing police, FBI agents, and bombing Coney Island were plans discussed by the suspects. The FBI believes their plans were very preliminary, but they say this backs up the growing concerns over the reach of the terror group. The FBI director says the agency has current investigations into homegrown radicals in every state, and a portion of them are ISIS supporters. The arrests are just the latest examples of the growing dangers of lone wolf terrorists inspired by ISIS, and the possibility that more such terrorists could try attacks in the future. Mark Martin, CBN News. The FBI says more than 20 people in just the past year have been arrested trying to fly from the U.S. to join ISIS. The number of Christians kidnapped by ISIS in Syria has risen to 220 in the past three days, according to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. And the Syrian Democratic Organization says ISIS raided 33 Assyrian villages, picking up as many as 300 people along the way. Right now, officials can't confirm the exact number of hostages, but both humanitarian organizations have confirmed reports that ISIS has been taking the Syrian Christians from a chain of villages over the last several days. Pat? That's what will happen to those Christians, by the way. The men will be slaughtered. They'll be beheaded. Uh, the women will be sold as sex slaves. <clears throat> it is one of the most ghastly things. And yet we have a president who will not name them. He refuses to say Islamic terror. He has all these conferences and meetings, never says it. So uh, my friend Rudy Giuliani who was a powerful mayor of New York and a you know, crusading uh, crime fighter and all the rest of it, he said, I don't think Obama loves America. Well, there was a poll, I think it was a YouGov or something, one of those smaller organizations had a poll, and uh, they said, what about it? Do you think he loves America? 47% of the people who took that poll said, we're not sure that he loves America. Kind of bad. And Mort Zuckerman, who's the uh, uh, publisher of U.S. News and World Report, and I believe his organization owns the Daily News in New York, uh, he said, Obama's been asleep. He said he's been on these uh, international things. He's been asleep. He goes against Israel. Uh, he doesn't do anything about what's going on in Syria. Uh, he allows ISIS to, to come back and take over Iraq. Uh, we've got a problem in Yemen, and you, he goes down the list of all these things, and he says the, the president's like asleep at the switch, and he says, I just wish we had somebody who was actively engaged in foreign policy. Well, one of the big foreign policy problems we're dealing with right now is our most staunch ally in the Middle East. Now, you see, the Israeli prime minister, it's not a question of a, of a settlement. It's not a question of an apartment project in Jerusalem. It's a question of the survival of that state. If the Iranians get nukes, they have vowed that they will wipe Israel off the map. So he has, is facing another holocaust like what happened under Hitler. And John, you can tell us more about his upcoming visit. Well, Pat, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warns that major world powers have given up on trying to stop Iran from developing nuclear weapons. U.S. and Iranian officials have reported progress in nuclear negotiations on a deal that would clamp down on Tehran's nuclear activities for at least 10 years, then slowly ease restrictions. But Netanyahu says he cannot accept a nuclear Iran 
and warns it would be dangerous for the entire world. They might accept this, but I am not willing to accept this. As Prime Minister, I am responsible for the security of the country and the security of Israel's citizens. I must do everything I can to express our objection and warn of the dangers not just for us, but also to our neighbors and the entire world of Iran arming itself with nuclear weapons. And Pat Netanyahu is scheduled to address Congress next week. The amazing thing is that Susan Rice, who's not exactly known for her accuracy, uh, has come out and said how unhelpful uh, it was the fact that he has, quote, bypassed the White House. Well, the Congress has a perfect right to have whoever wants to speak, and if it's a matter of uh, international significance. So uh, some of the senators and congressmen have uh, avoided. Joe Biden is conveniently out of town. John Kerry is going to be off someplace, and some of the others will not show up. Well, if the Democrats turn on the uh, Jews in America, the Jewish uh, f f uh, businessmen, the Jewish, what's called the Israeli lobby, has been strong supporters of Democrats. They have not been Republican supporters. They've supported Democrats. So if the Democrats in Congress turn their back on the prime minister of Israel, it will have profound political implications coming up into the next election. John? Pat, here at home, U.S. regulators are moving toward tougher rules for Internet providers. Today, the FCC is set to approve a plan that puts the Internet under the same regulations as the telephone under a law that passed in 1934. Supporters say the government needs to make sure Internet companies can't slow down web traffic by giving priority to big websites. Critics aren't buying it. They say net neutrality could morph into heavy-handed government interference. Gordon Krovitz of the Wall Street Journal recently wrote that under the 1934 law, almost all websites and apps would be subject to regulation. Some Republicans want to know if the Obama White House improperly influenced the FCC's plan on net neutrality. The case over the regulations could be tied up in the courts for years and had a lot of interest on this topic. More than four million public comments on the issue. That's the largest number ever on a proposed rule. The Internet is a marvel of the world. It is free. And think how many uh, businesses have been spawned on the Internet. Think how much uh, web traffic there is. Think how much eye business goes on. Think of uh, all the conveniences that we have now as the consumers. And think of the constant improvement, the speeds and the, the things that are being done to improve the service that we have on the Internet. Now they're going to treat it like it's a water company or an electric utility with 1934 regulation. The Obama people, you don't understand, ladies and gentlemen, do you realize the socialist agenda is to take control of everything. They can't, they've, they, they've got their hands on health care and they're about to ruin it. Now they want to ruin the Internet. And I don't know what we can do to stop it, but Wheeler, who's the head of the FCC, has refused to testify to Congress. He has defied them. He's going to do what he's going to do, and don't ask me about it. So that's, that's what they're saying. Uh, I don't want to live under a dictatorship. This is the land of the free and the home of the brave. Let's fight for it. If you don't stand up and say something, they're going to run over you like a steamroller. That's what's going on. I mean, our liberties are being eroded every single day that those guys are, are up there in Washington doing what they do. Okay. Now, this is something that is deeply embedded now into the church, into pastors into men of God and women of God. They say it's a harmless vice. Well, that's harmless vice happens to be warping a generation. In their senior year had higher scores as psychopaths. We are teaching our males to be psychopaths. The hidden cost of pornographic addiction coming up next. When well, you're watching the 700 Club, we're delighted to have all of you with us. $97 billion, that's the net take 
of what's called the pornographic industry. Where does that term come from? The Greek porneia is the word for fornication or for sexual intercourse. And pornography means writing about sexual intercourse. And so porno pornographic and pornography uh, has to do with pictures and displays of people engaged in various types of sex. That's what it is. Well, it's gotten more and more graphic, more and more explicit, and uh, more and more pervasive. There was a time that people who were so-called voyeurs had to go to some peep show in Times Square to take a look at dirty pictures. Or they had these little books, you know, the little, what they call them, big little books, that they sold to kids and others that had dirty pictures of them and graphics and things like that. Now, it is highly, highly uh, uh, produced, uh, the finest minds, because it's big business. Beautiful women, handsome men, it looks so alluring. Well, despite all of the evidence to the contrary, many people think there's no emotional cost to engaging in pornographic viewing. But as Paul Strand reports, they not only hurt themselves, they can bring severe pain to their entire families and all those who surround them. Pornography has become so mainstream, much of society is starting to believe it's harmless. What you'll often hear from porn users is, well, I'm not hurting anybody. But the truth is, there are very real victims. For instance, girls forced to act in obscene productions against their will. What was happening to me was a lot of violence and bondage and um, being raped and kicked and beaten. Nadine, at this conference on sexual exploitation, told of how the man producing torture films starring her put her in an aquarium with a huge boa constrictor. And then dropped the snake in on top of me and closed the lid. And he filmed me, uh, my terror, which hadn't got anything to do with sex except that I was naked. This blatant exploitation wouldn't happen if there wasn't such an X-rated demand. And these consumers often hurt the ones closest to them like the wife of longtime addict Matt Russell. It was just a constant companion of mine, despite marriage, despite children. It really sunk me because I felt, um, I felt that he preferred just even the image of someone over me. And as a woman, that's a hard thing to handle. It finally got to a point where I just said, I'm done. I'm done with this, and we separated. Kathy Dyer's husband, Greg, drove her to seek therapy to deal with his addiction and the affair that followed. I had this gaping wound, <laughs> and I knew that if I didn't get some counseling, I was going to hate men. These husbands eventually broke free and both couples reconciled, joining a Lakeland, Florida church that tackles porn addiction head on. Kevin Conrad leads an accountability group there. I have seen uh, men lose jobs, uh, careers, not just jobs, but careers. Uh, I've seen them uh, lose uh, families, lose children, lose uh, relationships with parents and siblings. Church counselor Trina Mewborn sees how that desire for the X-rated destroys marriages. Just based on the couples that I've seen through the years, at least 50% of the couples that are coming forward have some type of struggle with either pornography or internet affairs or some type of sexual issue. CBN News talked to Pastor Jay Dennis about the problems within churches. Have men lost their jobs? Have men lost their wives over, over pornography? Absolutely, and I hear it continually. Uh, I see it in the church. I see it among pastors. Such as Tom Wolf, a youth pastor whose life in the X-rated world led to a series of affairs. And I uh, was uh, found out and obviously lost my job, lost my church, lost my youth pastor's job, and, and uh, for a while lost my family. Missionary Nick Ripkin says so many young Christian men are now addicted, they can't be on the mission field. 90, 95% of them are trapped in pornography. They got started at 11, 12, 13 years of age. They can't get out of them. And you can see it in the numbers. The current ratio is seven female missionaries for every male. And we're gonna stand before God as Westerner, as men, and say, two billion people can die and go to hell so I can watch naked women on the internet. And men aren't the only ones. Former addict Crystal Renault says one in three visitors to adult websites are women. This is me at the age of 10. Just a few months before, I would find my brother's stash of porn in his bathroom that would catapult me into an eight-year addiction of, with pornography and sexual addiction. Even with the actual visual pornography, 
women are being drawn into it by the droves. Renault testifies how this takes people into darker and riskier places. For women who struggle with porn, it is said that 80% of them will escalate their behaviors into in-person encounters. Sometimes it leads to criminal behavior. I know of uh, educators who uh, are viewing pornography in their classrooms. I know of educators that uh, just simply um, you know, are taking advantage of, of children. In her research, psychotherapist Marianne Layden sees a consistent link between those who consume porn and those who commit sexual violence. And she talks about a frightening study of college males who use more and more pornography during their time on campus. In their senior year, had higher scores as psychopaths. We are teaching our males to be psychopaths. Some men declare the reason they're such lustful creatures is that's just who men are. That is absolutely going against everything that Jesus has taught us. They can help it. They can choose against this. Dyer says they know in their hearts they're wrong. Why do you hide it from your wife? Why do you hide it from God? It's not a problem. Why do you hide it in your house from your kids? Because you know it's not right. Nadine blames these addicts for what happens to women like her. They don't know about the degradation that happens inside you, the tearing at your soul, the ripping out of your heart when you get filmed like that. And then to know that there are people, men, most, mostly men, but women that are gawking and staring and eyeing everything. Pastor Dennis says viewers can change all this by imitating the godly man Job. In Job 31.1, he said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. And accepting Jesus Christ died on the cross to set men free. So that we wouldn't have to be the way we are, that we could change, that we wouldn't have to give in to our sinful natures. Some declare they cannot live without pornography. Well, it just isn't so. Truth is, no one in history has ever died from a lack of pornography. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Lakeland, Florida. Great word, Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> what uh, uh, was just said, um, the Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. Uh, this is a, a natural tendency. You know, the sex drive is natural, just like the appetite to eat food is natural. But gluttony is uh, unnatural. Uh, the, uh, the desire to drink is natural. You have to have liquid or you'll die. But the consumption of alcoholic beverages is a different matter, and that becomes an addiction. So somehow the devil will take what is natural and use it to destroy people. And you don't want to be a slave of Satan. But for those of you who are watching, I want everybody to know this is an addiction every bit as strong as cocaine or heroin or any of the other addictive drugs. It is sometimes harder to break, especially for women. It gets to be a terrible thing, but you can do it. But the question is, are you willing, in a sense, to die to this stuff? And if you are, then the Lord himself will set you free. But you've got to give it up. We have a little booklet that will call uh, Trapped in Temptation. And we'll be glad to give it to you. If you've got a problem like this, we'll send it to you. 1-800-759-0700. Uh, uh, now, coming up next, We've got confessions from somebody who was actually addicted to porn. I was looking at pornography every day. I was the biggest poser, the biggest hypocrite. But that's not all this man revealed. Hear the rest of the story coming up next. Speaking of Jesus, said, quote, he made a show of them openly triumphing at his cross. The thing about pornography that causes people to get, stay in bondage is secrecy. They're ashamed. They don't want to tell anybody. They've got this addiction, but they don't want to talk about it. And so they cover it up. They cover it up. And the devil works in darkness. When Chris Beale confessed his darkest secrets to his wife, Cindy, he revealed three at once. First, he admitted to being a porn addict. Then he said he had an affair. And finally, he revealed that his mistress was actually carrying his love child. It's been uh, 32 years, and I can still 
tell you exactly what I looked at 32 years later. Chris Beal was eight years old when he saw his first porn magazine. It was the craziest thing. There was a kid in the neighborhood whose brother worked at a gas station and brought old issues home. As a teenager, Chris started buying his own magazines. It wasn't until the internet came out in late college that it was just gas on a fire. Because now, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to deal with the humiliation of buying something at a store. And that's where it just went from um, kind of a constant struggle to, a, to an all-out addiction. Chris met Cindy while both were attending college in Texas. I don't know if you call it love at first sight because we had seen each other before, but we knew that first time spending time together, I just knew. I knew he was it. Chris and Cindy married, but Chris's addiction got worse. It finally got to a point where I was looking at pornography every day. Cindy didn't fully know. She kind of knew this was a every once in a while struggle, but she didn't know the full extent. Chris was a minister of music at his church, and he spent a lot of time alone in his office. Most of the time he would view it was at work. So I didn't see him doing it, and I didn't know that it was getting bad. And then it went from looking at images to, um, to chatting with people. And then the unthinkable, I knowingly, fully knowing what I'm doing, I met one of them. I can never say that I kept my vow. I broke my promise. And I was just in this world of darkness. And I, and I hated myself. And then I got up on stage to lead worship on Sunday morning. And I was just, I was the biggest poser, the biggest hypocrite. Chris's pastor Craig encouraged him to be a man of integrity who has no secrets. I resonate with everything he's saying, yet I'm not that guy. I'm the antithesis of that guy. And um, I tried, I tried to manage it. I was able to, to deal with it for six weeks. And I just, I couldn't handle it anymore. My, it was as though the Holy Spirit had put me in a corner and said, we are going to deal with this issue. He confessed everything to me. I've been unfaithful to you many times, many different women many different places over the course of about two, two and a half year period. Um, and I'm just listening. You, you're kidding. This huge weight is now gone because for the first time since I was eight years old, I am a man with no secrets. On the other side, I've taken this burden. And it's not like it just randomly went away but I've placed the burden now on my wife. And if that's not enough, the final part, he just said, um, and one of the women is pregnant, and I'm pretty sure that I'm the father. I found it to be the worst day of my life, and then the next morning I realized, well, so was that one, and the next one. So it was just a bunch of worst days of my life, all in a row. And there's nothing that I could do to make it better. And so for the first week, we just, sat silent for hours and days and cried and talked and she asked questions and I answered questions. Chris asked for Cindy's forgiveness. Cindy didn't know what to do or where to go. Chris told the staff at his church what he had done. He lost his job, but his pastor didn't lose faith in Chris. He was going to lead uh, our church through the truth. And that petrified me, petrified me. I've never experienced the body of Christ like I did that day. It wasn't the things that they said. It was just, there was genuine love. They loved us. I had so betrayed them and they loved us. And, and that was the first moment that I knew God was up to something great. But Cindy still needed time to think and pray. She left for a few weeks to stay with her mother. 
When I got there, my mom said, hey, I've made an appointment for you to see Brother Dan, her pastor. Oh, Lord, really? I have to see someone else to tell me to stay married and be a good wife? And he said, you know, what you've been through is really difficult. Nobody would blame you if you left. I'm like, yes. And he said, but. I'm like, oh, there's a but there. He said, but you are not a fool to stay and be a part of the redemptive work in a man's life. I'm thinking, yeah, I, tr I trust you, God, but I don't trust him further than I can throw him. And once a cheater, always a cheater. And, you know, he's just going to, I'm going to be a doormat. And the, the world says I'm an idiot if I stay. And, and God's just like, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? And finally, I just said, well, yeah, you've never let me down. I do trust you. That moment, his peace just washed over me. And um, I just never forget having this renewed sense of, I think, I think we can do this. And before she even said, I'm committed to this marriage, I could see that God had put that in her heart. And um, that was a great day. Chris and Cindy started over. Cindy forgave him completely, and their trust in each other started to grow again. They had two sons of their own. Chris's third son lives with his mother. After a couple of years, um, Cindy would just cry because she loved him like her own son. And today, he is not a reminder of my sin. He is a reminder of the redemption of God. He is one of the greatest joys in this whole terrible story. I mean, he is, he is the scripture that says that God will cause all things to work together for good, personified. It's that little boy. Chris and Cindy will tell you that their marriage isn't perfect. It's a work in progress. I believe that God is in the business of performing miracles today. He's still in the business of doing those miracles. And my marriage is just that, a miracle. There is no hope for freedom. There's no hope for restoration until you um, can just wade in the waters of truth, which is you're enough and He loves you more than anything. And then in the midst of that love, have the courage and the trust in a good God to do whatever it takes to be free, to confess it, to bring it into the light, and to then spend the rest of your life, the rest of your life, um, just loving and earning the opportunity mm -hmm. to be one of the great stories of God. That your conscience might be cleansed from dead works that you might serve the living God. Oh, what a story of redemption, Chris and Cindy. Chris is free, and you can be free too. You can be free. God doesn't want to condemn you. God wants to cleanse you that you might serve Him. God has a plan for you. He has a plan for you, and a plan does not include destroying you, nor destroying your marriage. He has a plan that you might be redeemed. And what He asks you, will you come to me? The thing about Chris and Cindy is Chris got truthful. He opened up. He made a show of them openly, and the Lord triumphed in His cross. And that's what can happen to you. I want triumph in your life. And so if you want that, will you call out to him with me? I'm going to lead you in prayer right now. God's going to set you free. Don't hold on to this stuff anymore. Today will be the day that you'll be set free. Now, pray these words. Jesus, that's right. Jesus, I come to you, Lord. I confess my sin. I make a show of them openly. And I believe that your cross triumphs over all the sin of the evil. And I take from you your forgiveness, and I take your deliverance. And from this moment on, in your power, I am free. Thank you, Lord, for restoring my home, my marriage, my life. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you prayed with me, I want to give you something. I've got a, a little book that's called Love and Marriage. It'll talk about what God's perfect will is for you. I'll give it to you free. Call in if you want it. 
also a new day about what happens next. If you've just accepted the Lord, I'll give you this. But more than anything, I want you to call and say, I prayed with Pat. I'm free. Make a show of them openly triumphing in his cross. 1-800-759-0700. Somebody's here now who loves you, cares about you, and only wants to see the redemption of God work out in your life. Well, still ahead, the man <clears throat> and the mansion who cradled the civil rights movement. Presidents and heads of corporations called on Dr. Moten to step in and help navigate those difficult waters. Watch history unfold on these grounds with Scott Ross and a very wonderful person. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. An American missionary who contracted Ebola six months ago in Liberia has recovered and is heading back to the West African nation. Nancy Reitbull and her husband David told CBN News they feel led to return and do all they can to be the hands and feet of Jesus. The Reitbulls work with SIM, Serving in Mission, an international mission organization. Nancy contracted Ebola last summer when she was helping to disinfect doctors and instruments used in the crisis. The World Health Organization reports the Ebola epidemic has killed close to 4,000 Liberians. And in Nigeria, the armed men who abducted an American missionary this week are demanding a ransom of nearly $300,000. Phyllis Sorter was taken from her Christian school compound in the central part of the country. Nigerian police urged the family not to negotiate with the abductors, expressing confidence that Sorter would be found. Friends and family described Sorter as a visionary involved in multiple projects that helped the Nigerian people. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, if these walls could talk, the ones at Holly Knowles would have quite a few stories to tell. Those walls saw pillars of the civil rights movement pass through on their way to making history. Today, the home is being restored by a dear friend who was a former head of our school of government, Kay Coles James. And Scott Ross sat down with Kay to talk about the house and the man who built it. Along the picturesque banks of Virginia York River stands the stately Georgian mansion Holly Knoll. But history remembers it as the cradle of the civil rights movement. This place is on the National Historic Registry not because of the architecture, but because of the important things that happened here. It was on these grounds that famous African Americans, including Martin Luther King, conceived the social, and political ideas that transformed the nation. That is the tree that we are told that Martin Luther King sat under and looked out over the York River while he prepared himself to go to Washington to give his famous I Have a Dream speech. Within these walls, the idea for the United Negro College Fund was formed, as was the legal strategy that desegregated public schools. When CEOs from Woolworths, Kresge, and Sears secretly traveled to Holly Knoll and met with student leaders, an agreement was reached that desegregated lunch counters months before legislation was passed. From the day the doors of this house were opened, the vision always was for racial reconciliation, how to educate African Americans in this country, Kay Coles James, former U.S. Director of Personnel Management for the federal government, purchased the site in 2005 with plans to restore it to its original purpose. Built in 1935, Holly Knoll was the retirement home of Dr. Robert Rusa Moten. The son of freed slaves, his mother, and the daughter of her former slave mistress taught him to read. He went on to higher education, then administration at Hampton University before becoming the second president of Tuskegee Institute 
now university. He was one who believed in education and how education could set one free and open up new vistas and new boundaries. He also believed in self-sufficiency and independence. He believed in a strong work ethic. And most of all, I think the secret to Dr. Moten and his success and his accomplishments is that he was a great man of faith. From the World War I battlefields of France to the Delta Flats of the 1927 Great Mississippi Flood, Dr. Moten advised five U.S. presidents during times of national crisis. He was so well respected that when the racial tensions in this country were at their height, presidents and heads of corporations called on Dr. Moten to step in and help navigate those difficult waters. He also suffered the indignities of racism along with his fellow black citizens. As the keynote speaker at the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial in 1922, Dr. Moten wasn't seated along with the dignitaries of the day, but rather placed in the colored section. And when you think about the irony of that, at the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial, that he was not honored to sit with the other very important people that day. So he suffered a great deal of uh, racial uh, injustice himself. And I think one of the models there is that he stayed positive through it, found those individuals nationally and locally who were willing to make progress and worked with them. After he died in 1940, his home remained a hub for black leaders through the civil rights era. It then fell into disrepair until Kay rediscovered it. I said, how is it that Monticello is taken care of? How is it that people go to Mount Vernon and are able to learn and walk through their history? But how is it that the place that's known as the cradle of the civil rights movement has windows broken out and vines growing up and the roof is off? The decaying structure was deeply personal to Kay. Her connection to the historic site goes back to the late 1950s and her impoverished childhood. I started out in the public housing projects of Richmond, and I had an aunt and uncle who were a part of the social and intellectual elite of Virginia and probably even nationally. And I would be brought here with my cousin so that I would be a companion for her while they spent the week here. And I have wonderful memories of being just a very young child sitting on the floor here with my dolls and books. And all I remember is that the black people who gathered here, I, I remember thinking they're so smart and they're so talented and they're beautiful. And I remember the food was great here too. <laughs> In this restful place, they planned, wrote, and reflected to gather strength to speak, sacrifice, and even die, so children like Kay would one day have a better future. With her return to Holly Knoll a half century later, she restored the site and founded the Gloucester Institute to mentor another generation of minority leaders. And I thank God placed it in my heart to restore the property and the vision my husband and I formed the nonprofit and have dedicated our lives to restoring not only the bro bricks and mortar, but also the vision as a gathering place for racial reconciliation, where we can deal with the important issues of the day, a place where politics are left aside and we come together as people who want to find solutions. Well, it's a beautiful story, and it's real. And for more from K. Cole James and the Gloucester Institute, go to CBN.com. Well, still to come, we'll be bringing it on with your email questions. Judith wants to know, said, I once heard that a test of something in the Bible being true is that it was mentioned three times. Is that true? Well, there'll be an easy answer to that one. Well, nearly two million of Kenya's children are orphans, like 12-year-old Edmund. Well, when we met him, Edmund was hitching rides on buses. 
sleeping on the streets and eating garbage from the dump. Edmund always dreamed of becoming a doctor, but when his parents died, the 12-year-old was sent to work. I went to town to sweep houses and shops and to collect scrap metal to sell. I gave the money to my grandmother. Edmund was always hungry and no one looked after him. My life was so hard I couldn't stand it anymore. I saw a bus coming so I snuck on it and hid under a chair. He slept on the streets and ate garbage from the dump with the other homeless children. Then he saw some kids who looked happy. The children were from an orphanage supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. When we noticed him, we asked him to stay and share the food we had. Here at the orphanage, more than 50 children have been rescued from wars and poverty. We love them all. So we teach them about God and instill Christian values in their hearts. We make sure they do well in school so they can be independent one day and have a good quality of life. Edmund is just happy to have a home. I feel good here because I have food to eat, water to drink and clothes to wear. Before I came to this home, I did not know who Jesus was, but I met him here. Uh, Terry is involved in Orphan's Promise, that's her dream, and we've been delighted to embrace it. It's a wonderful thing. Thousands and thousands and thousands of orphans around the world are being helped by Orphan's Promise. So that's one of the uh, significant ministries of CBN. We have a number that we are engaged in helping, and uh, that's one of them. So if you want to participate again, just pick up the phone and say, look, you can count on me. I want to do something to make this world a better place. The number is there on your uh, screen, 1-800-759-0700. Say you can count on me. Okay, it's time for questions. We're running out of time. This is the 700 Club. We're glad you're with us. A lady named Judith wrote us, sent in a message on the Internet. I heard once that a test of something in the Bible is true is whether it was mentioned three times. Is that true? No, Judith, it's not. The Bible says, let everything be established in the mouth of two or more witnesses. So you go to court, one witness won't cut it. You've got to have two, not three, two or more witnesses. If you got three, hey, that's cool. You can get four or five, but there's nothing that says it's got to be three. It's a two or more. Okay. There's somebody named G, uh, I guess that's the name, said, where do you think we are along the end time, timeline? And what does the Bible teach about Antichrist as far as coming from Europe? I think the Antichrist is going to come out of the Middle East. And I really believe, and I know it sounds weird, but the more you see it, and the more you see the parallels, I do believe that the rise of radical Islam is a fulfillment of the Antichrist. It's doing exactly what Antichrist would do. And they are surrounding Israel. And you look at the Muslim countries, Iran, and Syria, and I guess Lebanon now, and Turkey, and the Sudan, and all these countries, they're surrounding Israel. And I, I don't think this business about Europe is where the Antichrist is going to come from. But, you know, prophecy is still, we see through a glass darkly, and, you know, so we got various points of view. Well, uh, Carlene says, do you think it's wise to keep money invested in stocks, federal and state bonds? Or do you think we should keep our money in gold, silver, and cash at home because of present economic conditions and also to avoid another stock market crash? Um, I think the best place for your money is to get some dividends or some, some earning from a solid company. Uh, the uh, master limited partnerships that transport natural resources and so forth, I, I've been a fan of. They pay pretty high dividends. Uh, just plain old utilities. People are going to need water. They're going to need electricity. They're going to need all these things. And uh, regardless of what happens to the economy, sooner or later, people are going to have to have those things. Uh, there are a lot of ways, but let me tell you, we've got to trust the Lord. Uh, there is no perfect investment. 
Uh, I've been investing for many years, and I'm, I'm, I'm in charge of a pretty significant fund in terms of investment. I've done very well in terms of investments. But it's uh, to say that this is a sure thing, uh, no longer. The only sure thing I know of is in heaven. And that's what the Bible teaches. Don't put your money where moth and rust will you know, corrode it, and thieves will break in and steal. But you put your money in heaven. Well, uh, early he wants to know, if a person is on life support with organs failing and brain dead, where is the soul and spirit? I think the spirit is the indefinable essence of the human being. And uh, who am I to say that the spirit is leaving? I don't think the spirit leaves the body until such time as the body is dead. And I think life support, they're still keeping them alive artificially. But none of us know. So how can I tell you for sure on something like that? But I think uh, as long as the body is alive, the spirit is remaining with our body, and the combination performs what's called the soul. But when the body dies, the spirit leaves. And well, that's another issue. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute, taken from the Psalms, Psalms 84. For Jehovah God is our light and our protector. He gives us grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk along his paths. Thanks so much for being with us. 700 Club, watch it tomorrow, same time, same station. Bye-bye.